trumpet to sound We're all kind of homesick We're anxiously waiting For the glorious morning We'll rise from the ground So lift your hands beautiful song uh, given to us by our sister Tafadzwar, Fight On Wounded Soldier. It's going to be worth it all when he takes us away. I'm looking forward for that day. Myself, I want to invite you for uh, the first session of our series on the sanctuary and our times. This, I believe, will be a blessed series where we are going to reflect on what's going on up there in heaven and how it's affecting what's going on down here on earth. So to begin our series tonight, I want to invite you to pray with me as we get started. Father, thank you for giving us your guidance by your Holy Spirit. Feel us today and help us to see how heaven and earth are connected. For this is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. In this series, we are going to be addressing several questions together. And in today's session, we are going to just plow through 14 questions together that we are going to 
interact with. And every weekend from today, the time will be 6 p.m. when we shall be joining to study the Word of God together on sanctuary and our times. And so the first question we want to deal with together is this, is the question of which sign did Jesus promise many people will see when actually uh, it will be at the very end of time. What is that sign that Jesus promised we will see? And that sign is found in the book of Luke chapter 21 and verse 27, which says, Then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. This is the sign that everyone who is living will see. This is the Son of Man, Jesus, which means that Jesus will be coming in a cloud. This is the day that Tafazwa was singing about when he will call us away and we shall go to heaven to stay with him. But then you have to deal with the question of what are the things that are going to happen before Jesus comes through with the clouds of glory to come and take us to be with him. You are going to go a few verses before to be able to get the context of this. So what things did Jesus say will happen before we see him coming in the clouds? Let's have a look. The book of Luke, chapter 21, verse 25, says this. In the heavens there are particular signs, and there will be signs in the sun and the moon and the stars. You see, when we go back into history, we find that in the very first century, there were actually signs in the heavens. The historian Josephus records and says that during the surrounding of Jerusalem, there were apparitions that were seen in the sky, and many people were concerned, and they saw them as clear signs. We also know that in the 1780, there was a sign that was seen, a sign in the sun and a sign in the moon. In 1833, we also see there was a sign in the stars. And so there is a sense in which we are pointing out the words of Jesus meant something was bound to happen and history records that something actually happened. But that was not the only thing that Jesus said. You begin to think he talked about something happening in the heavens. But what about something on the earth? And you continue in that verse 25 and it says, And on the earth nations will be in distress anxious over the roaring of the sea and the surging of the waves. The signs in the sea, the roaring of the waves, they cause us as human beings, they cause every nation to be filled with anguish and distress over what's about to happen. We cannot forget the tsunami that came through the Indian Ocean in the year 2004. We cannot forget uh, what happened in Hurricane Katrina in 2005. It is not lost to us in the year 2011, the Japanese tsunami. Neither can we overlook Hurricane Sunday in 2012, which some people even today are still trying to recover from that. And you can imagine when you've gone through a traumatizing experience and you're likely to experience it again, what are people going to do? This is what Jesus addresses next. When you continue in Luke chapter 21 and verse 26, Jesus says it this way. People will be fainting from fear and from the expectation of what is coming on the world for the powers of the heaven will be shaken. You see, it is something that creates fear in the human heart, fear in the human mind. You have gone through a very traumatizing experience and all of a sudden you are saying that something similar is going to come back again. People's hearts filled with fear. They are afraid. They are anxious. There is anguish because they are afraid of what's going to happen on the earth. And the question is, even today, when we see the things going on, even with the tensions in the nations, the tensions in the streets, the tensions in the capital of the country, people's hearts are filled with fear. The coronavirus and the impact it has had on different people causes others to be filled with fear and you also realize the unemployment or even the prospect of being unemployed is causing people to be really terrified and afraid. 
The reality is this, my friend, it is natural for us to feel anxious, for us to feel fearful. But the question really is this, how does Jesus want us to respond? And so the third question we're dealing with is how did Jesus instruct his followers to respond when they see these things? This is how Jesus wanted them to respond. Luke 21 now and verse 28, he says this. Now, when these things begin to happen, look up and lift up your heads because your redemption draws near. This is the way Jesus wants his followers to deal with it. When there is a lot of anxiousness and a lot of fear and a lot of struggle, Jesus is saying, how you're going to cope with this is you're going to look up. But you see, today I want us to go a little bit deeper and ask ourselves, looking up, why? And what exactly is going on up there that affects us down here in a way that we can actually look up with hope and with courage? That is the gist of this series that we are going to be dealing with. And so, why do we look up? A story is told of some Christians who were being persecuted. And the persecuting guards were noticing that many times these Christians were always looking up. And it seems they were whispering words saying something to somebody. And one day one of the guards was asking himself, when these Christians look up there, what are they seeing? What am I missing? Because when he looks up, he only sees the empty sky. But this Christian seems to be interacting with somebody. It has been a long practice of many Christians in times of distress and times of pain to learn to look up. And I want to ask you when things are going tough, have you learned to look up? And when you're looking up, are you seeing what every other Christian was hoping for as well? Let's talk about that. Why do we have to look up? Because question number five is dealing with where does the Bible say Jesus went 40 days after his resurrection? Well, the book of Acts chapter 1 verse 9 to 11 it gives us this answer of where Jesus went. It says this, while they watched, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into the heaven? This same Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will so come in a like manner as you saw him go into heaven. See, the Bible records that Jesus who walked on this earth, who was familiar with our trouble, with our pain, the Jesus who was familiar with our hunger and our thirst, Jesus who was familiar with the storms and the raging storms of the sea and the waves, Jesus who was familiar with the injustices of humanity, Jesus who was familiar with the torture and the excruciating pain of the cross. Jesus, this is the same Jesus who went up into heaven and he is there right now. So when we look up, we are looking up to where the disciples were steadfastly looking unto, saying, yes, we have seen him go that way. So when things get messy, Christians, we are called to look up because we are focusing on where Jesus is. He is there beyond the messiness of the nature. Jesus is actually there. The captain of our salvation is up there. And when you're a soldier in the battlefield, you want to know the marching orders from your captain. And hence you have to look up. Looking up in prayer communing with him who is up there because you know that is where your hope rests for a moment such as this. Now, you deal with the question of why did Jesus have to go? Why did he have to go up there, especially after such a powerful resurrection? Why did he have to go up there? You see, one man 
uh, by the name of Philip Yancey has written a book, actually several books that I have enjoyed reading. One is called Disappointment with God. Another one is a book on prayer, but this one we are referring to is the book that Jesus I never knew. And in that particular book, in page 229, he makes the following statements. He says, I have concluded, in fact, that the ascension represents my greatest struggle of faith, not whether it happened, but why. It challenges me more than the problem of pain, more than the difficulty of harmonizing science and the Bible more than belief in the resurrection and other miracles. For me, what has happened since Jesus' departure strikes at the core of my faith. Will it not be better if the ascension had never happened? If Jesus had stayed on earth, he could answer our questions, solve our doubts, mediate our disputes of doctrine and policy. You see, Philip Yancey's reasoning seems to make sense anyway. If we had a question, we'll go to Jesus. If we disagreed on what we think the Bible says, we may go to Jesus. If the tsunami is hitting, we could ask Jesus to say something like, peace be still, and believe the tsunami will have calmed down. So why did he have to go? Why did he go up? Well, Jesus himself tells us, why he chose to go. It is found in the book of John, chapter 16, and verse 7. He says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. Jesus makes it known that it is for your good and my good that he chose to go. He also says that it is for our good because when he goes, the helper will come. It seems like a tight spot. We want him here, but also seemingly he has to go so that something will happen in our lives. I want to tell you a story that I want to utilize here to express an important part of why Jesus went. You see, sometime like two years ago, there was this uh, refugee crisis in uh, Northern Africa where we had a number of individuals who were putting even their own children in boats trying to sail uh, to Europe to be able to find a better life for themselves. A number of parents did this and some boats were overturned and some kids died in the process. We cannot forget that devastating picture of a child lying on the sea on the seashore, just looking sad because a child is dead out of this refugee crisis. You see, the thing is this, people were asking the question, why will a loving parent allow their child to go on such a risky travel? Why will a parent actually let the child go by themselves? Two years ago, I also attended a conference in this conference, one pastor gave a very un, a good answer that I thought was very profound. He put it this way. His name was Pastor Bath, Peter Bath. He said it this way. No one puts their children in a boat unless the water is safer than the land. Wow. That nobody will take that risk to put their child in a boat unless they begin to feel that the being in the water is better for them than being in the land. And they begin to feel being in the land is definite death. But maybe through the waters, you might sail and go across, you may get into a better place. Friends, I want to borrow that phrase in this manner, which is this. Jesus does not leave his children behind unless going is more important than staying. This, my friend, is a statement of faith. You will have to believe that what Jesus went to do up there was definitely more important than him staying here. Or rather, I will say this way, that if he were not going to go, his staying here will not have been as beneficial to you. But you see, there's a challenge there. Uh, Dr. Jerry Moskala in one of his papers talking about the intercessory ministry of Jesus in the heavenly sanctuary, he makes this point. He says it this way, God's distance and invisibility disturb us. 
His obvious physical absence frustrates human, especially in view of war's atrocities, pain, rapes, exploitation, killings, torture, innocent suffering, natural catastrophes, and the reality of death. Christians wonder where God is and what is he doing? This is a question that's not only plaguing the people who are non-believers. This question affects believers as well. They wonder, where is God when so much is going on right now? And what is he doing? Oh, my friends, when we look up, we realize he is there doing something very precious for us. And this is why we are taking on this series, to understand what is that. But friends, I want us to deal with this question first. Did Jesus actually leave us alone? Did he leave us alone down here? Are we orphans? Are we by ourselves? Now, Jesus himself addressed that question in the book of John chapter 14, verse 16 through 18. He said, and I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper that he may abide with you forever. The spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. Through the Holy Spirit, Jesus has actually fulfilled this promise. He has not left us as orphans. He has actually promised that through the Holy Spirit, Jesus will be with us. He will never leave us, nor forsake us. And so the ministry that he's doing in heaven, through the Holy Spirit, we get a sense that even in our time today, earth and heaven are still connected because through the Holy Spirit, we are reminded of what God is doing for us, in us, and through us even as Christ is fulfilling a very important mission up in the heavenly sanctuary. So, the question can also be asked, what did Jesus do when he got to heaven? What did he do? Well, the Bible gives us a good answer found in the book of Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 3. It goes something like this. Who, that is Jesus, being the brightness of his, that is God's glory, and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Jesus sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Friends, I just want to tell you this. Jesus sitting down and you sitting down is a different story. The sitting down of Jesus is not inactivity. The sitting down of Jesus paints a very powerful picture. Actually, allow us to borrow once again from Dr. Jerry Moscala's article on this ministry of Jesus in heaven. What does sitting down mean? For you and I, when you sit down, I'm tired, you even fall asleep. No, that is not the same way with Jesus. Let us see what it means. A difference exists between standing and sitting at the right hand of God. Standing points to intercession, whereas sitting refers to the rulership, victory, authority, and kingship of Christ's ministry. You can refer to Matthew 26, Romans 8, and Colossians 3. Standing also refers to the action of the judge who is ready to pronounce the legal verdict regarding the indicted person. This, the verdict brings deliverance and victory of condemnation. One of the two, and we're gonna see that here shortly, but the first part is to realize when Jesus is sitting, he is doing a work of ruling, which includes conquering all the enemies against him and against his people. Jesus is sitting not in inactivity, but Jesus sitting is actually an act of governance. He is on the throne. He is in control. When he is not on the throne, there could be a problem, but he's giving us a picture. Hey, listen, things may be looking messy down here for you, but in the midst of this mess, 
I am the one who is controlling everything to be sure that you finally make it to be in my kingdom. Jesus is doing something precious for us up in heaven. So when Christians feel that their times are tough, when they think that life is rough, we need to look to the heavenly sanctuary where Jesus sits as a ruler. You need to look to your king who provides the governance to address the problems for your life. But what about the promise that Jesus made? The promise of the Holy Spirit. What do we do with this particular promise? Well, I want you to track with me something interesting out of the book of the Revelation with regards to the Holy Spirit. Something like this. It says, Revelation 1, verse 4 through 5. Grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ. Just as a note, grace comes before peace. That means before you experience peace with God, you first of all need to experience the grace of God. And when you experience His grace, you can now enjoy the peace of God. But this grace and peace comes from the Father, who is represented as the one who was, who is, and who is to come. But also, this grace and peace is coming from the seven spirits of God, which represents the Holy Spirit, the complete ministry of the Holy Spirit of God. But also, this grace and peace comes from Jesus Christ. In that simple verse, you see the Godhead represented beautifully about the Father, Him who was, who is, and who is to come. You see from the seven spirits, which represents the complete ministry of the Holy Spirit of God. And you see Jesus, grace and peace coming from Him as well. But then I want you to notice this, that the Spirit is represented as being in front of the throne of God. Now, this is interesting because I want you to notice that when you go to Revelation chapter 4, something similar is happening. Revelation 4 and verse 5, it says this, And from the throne proceeded lightnings, thunderings, and voices. Seven lamps of fire were burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. You see, friends, the Holy Spirit being seen before the throne of God, this, my friend, is actually the preparatory scene before Jesus gets into heaven. And so Acts chapter 1 that we read earlier tells us about how Jesus is going up. But then what is heaven doing as Jesus is about to come in? There's a preparatory scene, and in that scene, the Holy Spirit is seen standing before the throne of God. But friends, I want you now to notice something. Because in Revelation 5, this is the time when now Jesus has entered into this throne room in heaven. And when he enters, I want you to notice something unique about where the Spirit is. Revelation 5 and verse 6. And I looked and behold in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures. This is in heaven, folks. And in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as though it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. Now, you don't see the Holy Spirit standing before the throne. Instead, you see a lamb. But then you notice the lamb has seven eyes. The seven eyes representing the full ministry of the Holy Spirit. In a sense, it gives you a picture. It's as though now the Spirit who was standing before God is upon Christ. And if you want to get another picture of this, it's as though it's the inauguration of Jesus where he's almost being anointed by the Holy Spirit here. That seems to be the picture we are getting out of it. And to get a good picture, at some point during our series, we are going to go into Leviticus and see how during the anointing of Aaron and what happened there for the oil to be able to be poured on his head 
and even flowing through his beard. No wonder the book of Psalm 133 tells us how pleasant and beautiful it is for brothers to dwell together in unity. It's like the oil anointed upon Aaron who was the high priest in the Old Testament, flowing from his head on his beard and flowing all the way down. But you see in Revelation 5, as soon as you're told about the seven eyes, which represent the sevenfold ministry of the Holy Spirit upon the Lamb, the next thing you're told is this Holy Spirit is sent out to all the earth. And so something happened in heaven. It's as though we get a picture of Jesus being anointed in his inauguration by the Holy Spirit, but that same Spirit now goes down to all the people in the earth. So the question now becomes, if that is what's going on in heaven, what is happening down on earth? The book of Acts chapter 2, verse 1 through 4, tells us what's going on on earth. It says, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and began to speak with other tongues, as the Spirit gave them utterance. Wow! The disciples were blessed. In this particular case, you can tell where the Holy Spirit came from. The heavens, this is what the Bible tells you in verse 2, there was a sound from heaven. I wonder, was that the singing that was heard in Revelation 5? You know, you read about how it happened in Revelation 5. Was that part of the singing that happened there? Was that the sound they heard and the Holy Spirit coming down upon them? And then Peter explains more about what was going on. He connects it to what was going on in heaven. He says in Acts chapter 2, verse 32 to 33, This Jesus God has raised up, of which we are all witnesses. Therefore, being exalted to the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out this, which you now see and hear. So everybody there being surprised. They notice something is going on. They don't know what's going on. Peter comes and says, guys, 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 hey, we are not drunk. What's going on? What you're witnessing is something that has happened in heaven because Jesus, who is at the right hand of God, has fulfilled his promise of sending the Holy Spirit to come upon us. Friends, I have a question for you. In this time, do you have any promises that you desire for God to fulfill in your life? Those promises that Jesus made, he in the heavenly sanctuary is still able to fulfill them in your life in this particular time. On that Pentecost morning, they also evidence that Jesus kept his promise. He had gone to heaven and he had delivered on his promise to send in the Holy Spirit. Now the question is, was this gift only for the 12 disciples? Or were there more who were going to receive the gift? Look at how Peter explains it in that powerful sermon on that Pentecost morning. In the book of Acts 2 verse 38 to 39 he says, Then Peter said to them, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you, and to your children, and to all who are of Do you have any desire for you to be filled by the Holy Spirit as well? This promise is for all who the Lord calls. You too in this moment can also be filled by the Holy Spirit. You need to ask God to fill you with the Holy Spirit, that you may know you are not alone. Through the Holy Spirit, the heavenly sanctuary on the earth, we are connected. We know that we are not going through this alone. It doesn't matter beyond the protest, beyond the riots, beyond the riots, beyond the uh, frustrations of the illnesses going on around us, the prejudice in culture and society. We are not alone because the Holy Spirit reminds us we are connected with God. But I also want you to realize that one of the prerequisites for the Holy Spirit, Peter says we need to repent and that we may be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of our sins. 
It's a call to repentance in this time that we may repent of our sins. And if we have not been baptized, we need to be baptized. And not only by water, but also by the Holy Spirit. This promise is for us. Even today, in the heavenly sanctuary, Jesus wants to pour upon us his Holy Spirit as well. Now, how did this gift change the disciples, you ask? Well, the book of Acts chapter 4 and verse 31 tells you this. And when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And they spoke the word of God with boldness. The Holy Spirit gave them boldness. So in our time, when people's hearts are filled with fear and anguish, you and I can be filled with boldness. Not because our own will can get us there, but by the power of the Holy Spirit. Even in our times today, we can have boldness and courage to face whatever situations are there for us. I appreciate the words of uh, Jan Paulsen from his book, When the Spirit Descends, that says this. Pentecost made everything, including themselves, look different to the disciples. They were new men. We read of Christians making all sorts of mistakes afterwards, and they are far from being perfect. But we do not again read of them hiding away for fear of man. The Spirit altered all that. We are able to show courage because of the presence of the Holy Spirit. Then Jesus promised that even in our times today, we shall have an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Why not pray to the Savior who is in the heavenly sanctuary that he may fill you and me with the Holy Spirit to stand in the time such as this. Now, as we draw towards a close here, two questions to deal with. Does this boldness by the Holy Spirit take away the dangers to the Christian life? The answer is no. One quick example we know, the very first martyr of Christianity was a man by the name of Stephen. The Holy Spirit came upon him, gave him the courage to speak, but that did not mean the danger to his life was taken away. We read about it in the book of Acts chapter 7 and verse 55 through 58. It says this, but he, Stephen, being full of the Holy Spirit, he gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God and said, Look, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Then they cried out with a loud voice, stopped their ears and ran at him with one accord. And they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witness laid down their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. The Holy Spirit did not take away the danger to the life of Stephen. The Holy Spirit gave him the courage to face the danger that he was in. But dear friends, what an amazing end to the life of Stephen. The last face that he saw was Jesus in the heavenly sanctuary. Now you ask, is Jesus standing there as his disciple was dying? Was it in vain that he died? You realize, no, 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 it was not in vain. You realize that there's a man there by the name of Saul and the death of Stephen, the courage he was given to face his death became a powerful testimony. But there is more to that, more than the testimony of Stephen in his death. You realize that Jesus is standing now. The one who sat as ruler is standing as his disciple is dying. And this Jesus standing, we spoke about how the standing of Jesus is a work of intercession. That his disciple will have the power to witness, to be faithful, to face the enemy of the gospel with courage. And say, yes, my loyalty is for Jesus, come what may. And I pray that Jesus may fill us with the Holy Spirit. That we may have the same ability to stand and the courage to keep on holding on even when things around us are looking messy. I wonder if Jesus was making a verdict then, what verdict did he give as a judge in that sense when he is standing? Because one of his own has died for his faith. But I also want you to notice this. Does Jesus stand again? Oh yes. 
Oh yes. This is why we are talking about the sanctuary and our times. The book of Daniel chapter 12 reminds us of this. It says, at that time, Michael shall stand up. The great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation. Even to that time and at that time, your people shall be delivered. Everyone who is found written in the book. Praise Jesus that he still stands for God's people. He still stands for those whose names are written in the book of life. Do you believe in Jesus, my friend? Jesus is standing also for you. I believe that when things are going tough in your life, don't give up. Look up and by faith see that the Holy Spirit is helping you to know we are still connected with heaven. When there's a challenge of bias in our country and people are feeling frustrated, look up. No, we are not alone. God is with us. When we need the courage to face our times by the Holy Spirit, we can have the courage to face everything that comes our way. And so my dear friends, soldiers of the cross, and even those who want to be soldiers of the cross, do you want to pray today for the anointing of the Holy Spirit upon your life? The Jesus who poured his Holy Spirit is still in the heavenly sanctuary, willing to pour out his Holy Spirit to you and me today. We need to come to him in prayer, come to him in re repentance, be baptized by the water and by the Spirit that we may be bold in this nation that needs Christians to stand for their faith and say, yes, no matter what, I am going to be faithful for the Jesus who is standing for me as well. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for this day. Give us the courage to believe. Give us the confidence that we need. May your Holy Spirit be in us. May we be filled by you, O oh Lord. Help us to be humble every day, to repent of our sins, and to have our hearts open, that even during this series, we will recognize what you're doing for us from heaven, that we might be encouraged and realize we are not alone because you're with us. For this is our prayer, trusting and believing in Jesus' name. Amen. May God bless you, dear friend. Next week, we reunite again to continue on the next session two of the sanctuary and our times. Be blessed. Don't lift your head with